CD8 cells, as we've already discussed in terms of general T cell activation, requires a two-step process in order for this to be activated, for the T CD8 cell to be activated. We have the antigen recognition process, which as I discussed is the binding of this antigen shown here. And that antigen may be a bacteria or a viral antigen. This particular cell is the infected cell. So let's go ahead and just assume it's a virally infected cell because viruses often get into these cells. And in this case, the viruses will then hijack the machinery necessary to make proteins. So you'll remember proteins began with DNA transcription um, in the nucleus, and then we send that messenger RNA out of the nucleus to be transcribed by or translated by the ribosomes like so. Well, this time instead of transcribing DNA that is our DNA, it'll transcribe a viral DNA. So we'll just put a big old V right there. And that viral DNA sometimes is in the nucleus, sometimes it's not. But regardless, our cells can't tell the difference really between a virus DNA strand and a cellular DNA strand. And so as a consequence, this cell starts churning out viral proteins and is even part of this virus assembly fact, uh, factory. And so we're going to be making thousands of new viruses. Fortunately, because of the MHC molecules and that process involved, if you need a refresher, go back and look at how class 1 MHC molecules work. Uh, those viral proteins are going to be grabbed up in the endoplasmic reticulum, transported to the surface of the cell. And so here you can see this little red dot is my viral protein. Remember, it could be a bacterial protein as well, but we're going to assume virus for right now to make it easier. To um, get the T cell activation, T an inactive T cell crawls along, encounters this infected cell. Now maybe generally the infected cells don't migrate, they stay put. So we've got these T cells that are going to have to crawl through the bloodstream, they're going to have to crawl through the interstitial fluid, through the lymph system, and so forth to encounter this cell. And to some extent this is an accidental process. But you do need to remember that these guys are releasing these interferons. Remember those? So these interferons uh, recruit those T cells to the location. It, they act like these breadcrumbs. You may remember the chemotaxins that I talked about. In this case, they act like breadcrumbs for that T cell to follow and find the infected cell. Natural killer cells will follow those breadcrumbs as well. In addition, those interferons help stimulate other cells they they're going to bind to and, and react to those interferons so that they can change their membrane to make it a little bit harder for viruses to infect them so that this cell would stay healthy whereas the virally infected cell it's toast there's really not anything it can do to save itself it's going to be dead um, I really just should stop trying to write because I look, I think my four-year-old has better handwriting than I do. All right, well, on this screen. So once we get activation of the antigen binding protein or the antigen recognition protein, so this um, activation process will then stimulate the cell, but we also have to have co-activation, co-stimulation with that MHC molecule. They both have to occur. So this receptor needs to be activated, boop, 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 boop. And then the antigen binding receptor has to be activated. And incidentally, that antigen binding is of the CD8 variety. And this would be, in this example, my CD8 cells. And you will recall that my CD8 cells are my cyto, cyto. I just said I wasn't going to write, and here I am writing again, cyto toxic and my regulatory I am not writing regulatory my cytotoxic cells once we get that activation now we are going to get stimulation um, of two things we're going to go through clonal expansion and that's what's shown here
So we might have had one or two or five or, I don't know, 20 cells that might recognize that particular antigen. But once this process is activated, we get this clonal expansion process and we end up getting an army of T cells that recognize this specific antigen. This one right here, they don't recognize anything else, they only recognize this antigen. And so we now have a host of T cells ready to go, primed and ready to attack. Now this clonal expansion process produces all three types of CD8 cells, okay? And that includes the cytotoxic, and the regulatory cells, which we already mentioned, but also this class of cells, the memory T cells. Now cytotoxic are going to go on to kill, that's their job, kill, 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 kill. Hence the name cytotoxic. Their job is to go and kill anything that is infected with the virus or the bacteria that produces this antigen. Now regulatory cells, these guys are the breaks. Remember, these guys say, whoa, let's not get over, let's not overreact, let's kind of tame this destruction a little bit. And so uh, this actually keeps the T cells from overdoing it. One of the things that can happen with infections is um, sometimes these infections can trigger autoimmune diseases, not because this is a self-antigen, but sometimes a cell these guys are releasing all sorts of cytokines that are stimulating the immune system and by chance a cell that recognizes self antigens might be stimulated and begin to attack. In fact, the leading hypothesis is that all autoimmune diseases start this way for a child, for example, that develops um, type 1 diabetes. It is very common if you tar start to talk to parents of these children, um, they typically will maybe end up with a cold or a flu or something of that variety. Um, give me one second, please. I'm going to go ahead and pause. Okay, we're back in business. Um, my, aunt, my scribbles went away, but that's okay. Uh, we were talking about the regulatory T cells putting on the brakes to um, prevent those autoimmune diseases, and I was talking about diabetes type 1 and how it often precedes an infection. Um, not precedes, my apologies, follows an infection. So a flu or uh, some kind of virus often triggers that process. Now the memory cells don't act, to, don't, they don't attack anything. They just hang out and they're long lived and so they're going to hang out in the lymph system and so forth and their job is to very rapidly activate and divide if this antigen happens to show up a second time or a third time. So we're getting a second infection or a third infection and so forth. And so these memory cells, very important to the acquired part of the immune system. We are learning, we are acquiring knowledge, we are adapting. And that's what this immune system does. And those memory cells are absolutely necessary for that process. Without the memory cells, then um, we don't get better. We don't, we don't become more efficient at fighting off infections. So we have to have those for this process of acquired immunity to work. Now, if it's a cytotoxic T cell, let's take a look at how that actually does some damage. It's a pretty interesting process. So we're going to have this cytotoxic cell latch on to the virally infected cell. And one of the things that can happen, let's talk about the per perforins. You've seen those before. So those are going to punch holes into the membrane of the cell. But then the other thing that, I, I, that happens, and I like to call this the kiss of death. That's kind of how I learned it. It's called the kiss of death. Um, and this kiss of death is the release of these cytokines that actually bind to a receptor on that cell and induce apoptosis.
The preferred way of killing a cell is apoptosis. This is a neater, cleaner, better way of dying. The DNA breaks down, the cell packages itself into little vesicles, and macrophages come in and gobble it up. Okay. Um, cell metabolism is disrupted as well, but really of these two, uh, these guys, this one and this one are going to possibly be on the exam, and the rest, this this is not. I don't. I don't really care about that. Well, what a bad physiology professor I am. I shouldn't say I don't care. I'm just pretty much not going to ask about it. Then we get into our memory cells. These are the memory T cells that I talked about. And uh, they really don't do any kind of killing. They're just going to hang out. But upon the second exposure to the same antigen, these are very quick to become cytotoxic T cells. And of course, they also replenish their supply of memory cells. So if you've got memory cells to measles because you've been vaccinated, or maybe you've had measles as a kid, then um, if measles, if you happen to be infected with measles, these memory cells go boom, and they're suddenly cytotoxic cells, and we have our army, and um, some of them still stay as memory cells, so we can do this again. And then the re regulatory cells, as I, I suggested, these are going to be involved in suppressing this response to limit the response of um, the T cells. They're really only effective after the first exposure. And as I mentioned, it's really just to kind of, our immune systems are so stinking awesome and so stinking robust and strong and, and good at what they do. And sometimes they're just too good. And so we need a way to kind of rein things in.